All right, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much um, for, for sticking it out until the afternoon. And I'm just going to keep talking, and then people will know that we're actually getting started again. Um, my name is Lee Goodmark. I teach here at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. And we are your last panel today. And we're going to talk about something a little bit different than we've been talking about for the rest of the day. Um, Oftentimes when we have conferences on alternative dispute resolution, you hear kind of a phrase that goes like this. But we don't do domestic violence. But we screen those out. But those families get helped elsewhere, right? And so what we want to do is talk squarely about domestic violence. That's what we're going to do right now. Um, and how I came to this work, I have represented people subjected to abuse for about the last 20 years. Uh, in 1992, because we're all playing show and tell today, I published a book <laughs> um, called A Troubled Marriage, Domestic Violence, and the Legal System. And when I pitched the book, really what I wanted to do was critique the legal system's response to domestic violence. And that's really all I wanted to do, because as somebody who's practiced in that system for a long time, I can tell you it's a mess. And what I was told was, well, you don't just get to critique. You actually have to have some solution to something. And I didn't know what that was. And that sent me kind of on an exploration as to what other solutions outside of the legal system might look like to deal with domestic violence. And one of the things that I came to is restorative justice. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, pretty much the third rail of alternative dispute resolution, which is, can you use some forms of ADR, namely in our context, restorative justice, to deal with cases of intimate partner violence. Um, so I come at this, you know, these guys are like RJ people, and I'm a domestic violence person. Um, but in some ways, that makes me really well suited to talk to you about why I think it is that, in fact, you can use restorative justice in cases of intimate partner violence, and it could be incredibly helpful in ways that the legal system is not. Um, so for some people, you know, the response that we have to intimate partner violence really works. And we've talked a lot about the civil system today, but in reality, Primarily in the United States, when we're talking about legal responses to domestic violence, we're talking about the criminal justice system. The vast majority of cases get funneled through the criminal justice system in some way. And although the protective order system is a robust scheme for dealing with domestic violence, that's not really what we're talking about right now. The retributive response to domestic violence, retributive is just kind of a fancy word for punishment, right? You know that. So that response, that criminal justice response, works for some people. But for other people, it doesn't work at all. Um, and I'm talking here about the victim side of things, not the offender side of things, just to be clear. That for some people subjected to abuse, punishment is not what they're interested in. They're interested in lots of other things that aren't well served by the criminal justice system. Um, so given that, and given that that's one of the big critiques that I make in my book, I started to think about what those other things might look like. And one of those things, as I said, is restorative justice. Lauren's going to talk a little bit more about what restorative justice is. So suffice it to say that restorative justice involves kind of three big questions. What's the harm? What are the results of that harm or the needs that are created by that harm? And what can we do to mitigate that harm? So it's a different vocabulary. It's not the vocabulary of crime and punishment. It's the vocabulary of harm and redress, a very different kind of orientation. Um, and I come to this, too, as a feminist, which is kind of interesting, because there's a significant feminist critique of the use of restorative justice in the context of intimate partner violence. Um, just so that you know what that critique looks like, very briefly to lay it out for you. One, it's not safe. Many of the same co uh, conversations that we have around mediation being unsafe for victims of domestic violence, same conversations in the context of restorative justice. Two, it doesn't hold offenders sufficiently accountable for their behavior, the thought being that the only way to really hold offenders accountable is to put them in jail. Now, we could have a really long conversation about whether that actually happens in the criminal justice system or not. Suffice it to say that the critique is it's not holding offenders sufficiently accountable. Three, it puts uh, the politics of gender and race in the forefront in problematic ways. And what I mean by that is one of the critiques, again, of alternative dispute resolution in cases involving women's issues, and particularly intimate partner violence, has been this is just second class justice for women, and primarily women of color and low income women, when we start shunting these cases out of the criminal justice system and into these other kinds of systems, that we're treating people as second class citizens because of the kind of problem they're presenting with. Fourth, there's a critique that uh, restorative justice is too offender-centered. 
that it's all about what the offender needs, what the offender wants, and the offender making his kind of ret uh, um, redress in some way. And the fifth critique is that it forces forgiveness on people who may not be ready to forgive. Right? That one of the ideas behind restorative justice is that there can be some kind of an apology, but if you don't want that apology, you shouldn't have to take it. Right? And so those are the big critiques, the big feminist critiques of restorative justice. But here's the problem. First, the criminal justice system doesn't guarantee anyone's safety. And I don't think I have to talk about that much further. You know, there's a, a phrase I just saw the other day. Um, someone used the phrase, she died with a protective order in her pocket. And we know more stories like that than we care to talk about. Two, the criminal justice system doesn't ensure accountability. When we talk about the criminal justice system as, a, as an accountability mechanism, we're making a bunch of assumptions, right? That there will be an arrest that there will be a prosecution, that there will be a conviction, and that some kind of suitable punishment will be meted out as a result of that conviction. If you follow those things down the line in terms of the statistics, at every place, at every point, cases fall out. So it's not true that we're getting that kind of accountability that people are assuming from the criminal justice system. Um, and in fact, the criminal justice system can impose trauma on victims of trauma, right? So Judith Herman, a psychologist who's done a tremendous amount of work with victims of crime, has said that if you were designing a system to re-traumatize victims of trauma, you could not do any better than the adversarial criminal justice system. And if you think about that, those of you who've been involved with the system, think about being cross-examined. Think about the delay. Think about the lack of ability of overworked prosecutors and overworked victim advocates to really inquire with you about what is your justice need? What will justice mean for you in this context? And to help you achieve that in some way. So this idea that there are all these problems embedded in restorative justice, I think, is just wrong. Um, and that it's not to argue that restorative justice is for everyone. It's not. There are lots of reasons for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But to just kind of push it aside wholesale because of these concerns, I think, is short-sighted. Because there are some real important things that restorative justice has to offer. First, it's an alternative to the ineffective criminal justice system. So for those of you who are unaware of these statistics, um, from 1994 to 2000, 1994, passage of the Violence Against Women Act, hundreds of millions of dollars of money, right, federal money going into courts, cops, and prosecutors. From 1994 to 2000, rates of domestic violence in the United States fell. So did the crime rate overall. They fell at exactly the same pace, despite the fact that we're pouring all this money into domestic violence work. From 2000 to 2010, rates of domestic violence fell less than the overall crime rate. Again, despite the fact that about 60% of the hundreds of millions of dollars authorized through Violence Against Women Act are going into the criminal justice system that should suggest to you that possibly what we're doing is not terribly effective. <coughs> and the criminal justice system affirmatively harms women, it affirmatively harms people who are offenders, and it affirmatively harms marginalized communities. And I can talk more about that in questions if people are interested in it. If you'll just believe me for now, I'd really appreciate that because I only have 15 minutes. <laughs> So one thing is that it gives us an alternative, right? So one of the things that my clients have said to me over the years, and I think that people who've been subjected to abuse say all the time, is what I want is options, right? I don't necessarily want to go down this one path. It gives us another option, something other than the criminal justice system. Two, one of the things that the battered women's movement has tried to do in the United States for the last 40 years is change community norms around intimate partner violence to make it so that communities accept that intimate partner violence is wrong and that communities have some responsibility for ending that violence. And somehow we've done that by sending all of our cases into the criminal justice system, which communities don't engage with in any way and which many of them are afraid of. 
That seems a problematic way of changing norms within communities. So what Nils Christie has said is when we professionalize justice, we lessen our capacity for self-government. And that's what we've done in the case of intimate partner violence. We've professionalized the response to intimate partner violence in ways that have taken from communities the ability to respond appropriately to intimate partner violence. Doing restorative justice work can help us put some of that work back into the community. A third way that restorative justice can create greater options is because it's not bound by the very narrow definitions of intimate partner violence that are used in the legal system. So in the legal system, when we're talking about intimate partner violence, we're def de <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to go fast, I apologize. We're generally talking about harm, physical harm, or threats of physical harm. There are lots of other forms of intimate partner violence, many of which are more damaging to people than physical harm. So I had a client, and I'll just tell you briefly who, and the longer story can be found in my book. Um, I had a client who, over the course of a 19-year marriage, um, experienced what I would say was the most extreme domestic violence I had ever seen, and still to this day have ever seen. The physical abuse looked like this. Over the course of the marriage, on three occasions, he did this to her. He also locked every door, every cabinet, every place in the house where she could conceivably need to be. He locked away the food, he locked away the cleaning supplies, he locked away the towels, he locked away the toilet paper, he locked away the computer. If she wanted a new spindle of toilet paper, she had to turn in, or a new roll of toilet paper, she had to turn in the empty spindle. If she wanted spending money, she had to turn in a three by five card that explained what she needed the money for. It could be granted or denied depending on how he was feeling that day. She was a teacher. Every day he would give her exactly enough money to go to the gas station, buy gas for the car, get herself to work, and get herself home. And every day she would have to renew that amount of money. If she wanted to wash clothes, she had to ask permission. Permission was granted or denied, depending on how he felt. Often she went to work in dirty clothes. If she wanted a clean towel, same thing. Over time, he came to tell her that she could no longer eat at the table with her children. She was forced to eat standing up in the kitchen. If she tried to speak to her children, he would interrupt and say, we're not interested in what mommy has to say, are we? At her trial, at her divorce trial, her friends testified that she had been an assertive, happy, an outgoing person at the start of this relationship. She was now plagued with anxiety disorder. She was completely unkempt. Her kids testified against her to say that she was incapable, essentially, of parenting. She had been systematically dismantled as a person. And the law could do nothing about any of that except this. That seems problematic. Restorative justice would allow us to recognize other forms of abuse and address those other forms of abuse and the harm that they do and allow us to put some measures into place that could deal with those harms. Restorative justice allows us to think about individualized justice in ways that a system, by definition, makes it hard to do. So if you go into the criminal justice system, there's an outcome. That outcome is criminal punishment. And that might be probation, and it might be community service, and it might be incarceration, but it's a pretty constricted outcome. If your outcome was something like, I want this person to go to schools and talk about the harm that they've done, You'd need a pretty creative and innovative prosecutor and judge to make that happen. But in restorative justice cases, that does happen. And it happens because parties are able to engage with each other to create individualized kinds of solutions. Finally, restorative justice allows us to honor the humanity of both people subjected to abuse and their partners. In the criminal justice system and in most domestic violence work, we demonize people who abuse, right? We have binaries, they're very clear. We have angelic victims and demonic abusers. And that's really problematic, right? It's problematic on a couple of levels. First, most of my clients don't see their partners as demonic. And if they were demons, what does that say about my client's judgment in getting involved with that person in the first place and choosing to have children with that person in the first place? Most of my clients still have some love for their partners, right, in some way. And these are often long-term relationships. It's not like on day one they got together, on day two he was abusive, and on day three they broke up. There's an investment of time and caring and emotion in these cases that we can't really honor using the tools that we have. 
the, on the flip side, it's important if what we're trying to do is achieve change in people who are abusive, and it seems to me that needs to be our goal, otherwise kind of what's the point? We're unlikely to change people by saying to them, you are bad, and therefore you should go into an institution that will make you worse. Restorative justice gives us the ability to try to make real change and to connect with people on a human level, to help them understand why their actions have been harmful and maybe to develop some empathy around those actions. So it's incredibly important, I think, that we think about restorative justice. Now, it's not for every case, right? One of the central tenets of restorative justice is that people accept responsibility before we go into the process. I'd say in about half of my cases, that would never happen, right? At least not right up front. And so we need to be thoughtful about the ways in which we use these processes and we need to not walk away from the things that make them special. What's happening in some parts of the world, I was in New Zealand in May talking about restorative justice there, where they use it quite a bit, and it's becoming systematized. It's becoming just one, one more tool that's used by state systems kind of routinely. And one of the things that's starting to fall away is ensuring that people are really accepting responsibility before they're going into these processes. That's a mistake. So we need to stay true to what's important, what's, what's great about these processes, what makes them a true alternative. But that being said, you know, there are various points along the criminal justice spectrum or along the lifetime of a, of a couple or a case where restorative justice might make a lot of sense. So uh, we've used, re restorative justice has been used, we've done nothing, they've done. Um, Restorative justice has been used pre as a diversion program, right, for people who've been willing to accept responsibility. It's been used as a sentencing program to help inform uh, sentences that judges give. And it's been used years down the line in victim offender mediation post conviction to help bring victims and offenders together to understand each other's perspectives. Um, and we can think about all of those places where restorative justice might be helpful if we are open to having this conversation. <laughs> So do we know that it'll work? Um, no, uh, but as Lawrence Sherman pointed out, and I should say Lawrence Sherman is the guy who did all of the mandatory arrest studies. For those of you who are not familiar with that term, mandatory arrest is the idea that any time there's a domestic violence incident and police go out to the scene of that incident, they make an arrest whenever they have probable cause to do so, regardless of whether the victim wants that arrest made. It's a deeply problematic policy. It's one that I talk about at great length. Um, here, there, everywhere in the world. Um, I think it's un incredibly problematic. So Sherman does the first study on mandatory arrest, and it's his studies that really drive the growth of the criminal justice system. He then comes back years later to say, these studies weren't so good, and in fact, mandatory arrest is deeply problematic, and this is why you shouldn't do it. So Sherman then becomes a leading restorative justice researcher. And what he says about restorative justice is that, frankly, the bar for success at this point is pretty low. Since there is no evidence that standard justice is any more effective than doing nothing in response to an incident of domestic violence, the only challenge to restorative justice is to do better than doing nothing. I think the charge for those of us who care about intimate partner violence, domestic violence, and who understand it and who care about what happens to both people subjected to abuse and their partners within these systems, and who want to see alternatives develop, and who worry about how badly this can all go if it's done by the wrong people. And you know, from here, you know, take a page from the mediation playbook, right? Despite the fact that there's been lots of talk about screening and lots of talk about the importance of ensuring that uh, cases involving domestic violence don't make it into mediation and the really uh, kind of Herculean efforts of folks who care about this work, what we know from the literature is one, most people don't screen, um, two, screening is not always effective, and three, lots of mediators have no training on domestic violence. Do I want to see that happen to restorative justice? You know, no. So I think the challenge is for those of us who understand these issues and care about these issues to be the people who create, uh, implement, and evaluate these programs so that we ensure that that expertise is in the room every time that we do this work. So how would we do that? Well, that's a conversation that we started to have in Baltimore. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren Abramson, who is the Executive Director of the Community Conferencing Center 
to talk about restorative justice and particularly restorative justice in the context of intimate partner violence. Um, and then we'll hear from Eve Hannon, who's at the University of Baltimore in the Family Mediation Clinic there and the new juvenile, or what are you calling it? Ju juvenile Justice Project at the University of Baltimore as well. Um, and Eve has kind of our cautionary note um, to think about what some of the challenges or pitfalls of using restorative justice as opposed to possibly other kinds of ADR processes might be.